We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Second Corinthians 8 and 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded. Everybody say abounded. abounded. Unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves praying with us with much entreaty that we, should, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus that he, as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also." Therefore, as ye abound, everybody say abound, abound, in everything, in faith, in utterance, and knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. And then reading in Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. The Apostle Paul there reiterating the same theme that he was talking about in 2 Corinthians of abounding in all things and becoming fruitful in the knowledge of God and in the things of the Lord. And finally, I'd like to read from Deuteronomy, the second chapter, going way back to Deuteronomy, chapter 2. Read verse 1 through 3, and then skip to verse 7. Deuteronomy, chapter 2. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness. By the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. Verse 2, And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. Verse 7, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Verse 8, And when we passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain from Elath and from Ezion Gaber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And verse 8, is rendered a little differently in the New King, King James Version. Instead of saying, and when we pass by from our brethren, it simply says, we passed beyond our brethren. And you'll notice back in 2 Corinthians, in verse 3 of chapter 8, for their, to their power I bear record, yea, and... Beyond their power. Everybody say beyond. beyond. They were willing of themselves. Praise God. I'd like to preach to you for just the next little while on a very simple subject. Going beyond. 
going beyond. Amen. As we worship the Lord one more time, could you ask the Lord to have his hand on the rest of this service? Father, we praise you. We worship you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I love you, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, gracious God, I praise you now in Jesus' name. Bless the holy name of the Lord forever. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you, God. We give you praise today. Glory to God. You may be seated. The year was 1776. It was a bleak, cold, dreary December. The newborn infant known as the United States of America was struggling to breathe and to gasp its first breath of freedom's clean air. But it seemed that this infant would die a premature death. There was talk of defeat. The ragged Continental Army looked like it was defeated and there was nowhere else to turn. In fact, they had been pushed up into a place we know as Valley Forge and there they were holed up for the winter. The men were ragged. Their uh, ammunition was low. Some of them, their uniforms and tatters. Some of them even had rags instead of shoes on their feet. Talk of defeat was in the air. It seemed like there was no hope at all. There were plots against General Washington. Even their leader, their fearless leader that they so admired. Yet there was talk of intrigue and, and is he doing it right and, and did he make mistakes? You see, this army had been pushed beyond their limit, beyond the limit of their endurance, and almost beyond the limit of their hope. The future appeared to hold only gloom, doom, and death for them. But something happened in that bleak December. Something happened at Valley Forge that December that put new hope in the hearts of the ragged soldiers that put this bedraggled, downcast, defeated army back on its feet. It caused them to get into leaky old boats and to cross the icy Delaware River at night at great peril to themselves. It was something that made them go on and attack the Hessian army at Trenton, at the Battle of Trenton, New Jersey. And that battle became the turning point of the war of our independence. What was it that happened there? What was it that turned these men who were defeated and downcast into men who could stand up and go forward and fight and after they didn't think they had anything left to fight with? What was it that made them get up and go forward? There was a young journalist camped with the army at Valley Forge. And there in December... He looked around him at the men. He looked around him at the desolation and the feeling of despair and defeat. And he took up his quill pen and he began to write. The article that he wrote was entitled The Crisis. And it was several pages long. But most of us know the now famous lines. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. It is dearness only that gives everything its value, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. General Washington read the article and immediately ordered that it be read to all of the men. Those words by that young man's pen served as a torch to light the flame of hope in their hearts. And the army moved forward to conquer and to go forward in battle to victory. Whereas before they saw only despair and defeat 
It caused them to go beyond what they thought was humanly possible. And what led them to go beyond led them to victory. Brother Sibley, that is an old war story. It's been over 200 years since that battle was fought. What's so important about it? It's just part of history now. But I'll tell you why I think it's important today. Because we too are in a battle. We are fighting the forces of the tyranny of hell. We are fighting the spirit of this age. And it is our spiritual liberty that is at stake in this hour. And not only our liberty, but the liberty of the very souls of men are at stake. Millions of people today remain in slavery of sin. Why? Because they have never tasted the mighty rushing wind of freedom. They don't know what it's like to experience the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives. And there is a reason today for us to remember. To remember those words and to remember the cause that they promoted and remember that there is something worth going beyond for. Hallelujah. We're fighting for ourselves. We're fighting for others who are depending on us. And if we're going to win this battle, we've got to be like the soldiers at Valley Forge. We're going to have to be willing to go beyond some things. We're going to have to be willing to go beyond our own ideas about our own insufficiency. We're going to have to be willing to go beyond our pettiness and our foolish pride. We're going to have to be willing to go on beyond the love of the world and fleshly things. We're going to have to be willing to go beyond selfishness and stubbornness and insubordination. We must go beyond our carnality, our complacency, and our lack of concern about the things of God. <laughs> Hallelujah! We must go beyond, beyond ourselves, beyond our own personal desires. We must go beyond. For 40 years, Israel had wandered in the desert south of the Dead Sea. They lived in the flatlands. It was easily traveled. Deuteronomy 2 and 7 tells us that they prospered that the Lord blessed them as they went. Actually, when we think about it, it wasn't that bad of a life. They were provided manna from heaven. The Lord took care of their every need. Their cattle were blessed and grew and, uh, in number, and they prospered. Their clothes never wore out. Wouldn't that be nice? If your clothes never wore out. I noticed coming up here today, my button fell off my jacket. But if I would have been an Israelite, that button would have never fell off. Amen. They were always moving, but they never went anywhere. Here we are. Three million plus Jews. I don't know the correct number. We'll just round it off at that. Wandering around in the desert. Forty years. Everything's rosy. Everything's fine. Don't have to work for a living. Got it made. God is blessing me. God's providing everything I need. And then all of a sudden God says, stop! And three million Jews bump into each other. Trying to stop. Wandering around in a circle. He said, for the past 40 years, you have been wandering around and you have been uh, blessed in every way. But there's something that I want to show you. There's something that I want you to see. In Deuteronomy, he said, Jews, you have come past this mountain long enough. You've done well here. But this is not the place that I intend for you to live. 
This is not the place that I have prepared for you. Far to the north, there is a land that is flowing with milk and with honey. It is a place of abundance. It is a place, it is the land that God has prepared. It is a place of real blessing. It is a place that is something better than what you have now. And I want you to possess the land. The word compassed means that they had just been skirting the edges of Mount Seir. Just skirting the edges. Living right at the base. He said, you've lived in the flatlands long enough, folks. But to the north of you, there is Mount Seir. And Mount Seir was a, uh, an entire range of mountains. And he said, beyond that range of mountains is a place where I want you to go. And I want you to possess the land. It is the will of God for you to possess this land. It's yours for the taking. And oh, it sounds good. And it sounds like it's, it's the ideal place. And man, wouldn't we like to live up there? And wouldn't we like to enjoy the benefits of living in Canaan's land? Oh, the milk and the honey that flow. And the grapes the size of pomegranates. And all of the fruit and all of the vegetation, the lush scenery. Oh, wouldn't it be great to have that at our disposal? But there's a catch. There is a catch. You see, between you and the promised land, there lies Mount Seir. This range of mountains encompasses the land of Edom, the land of the children of Esau. And beyond that lies the land of Moab, where the Moabites live. And I want you to know something, Jews, before we get started on this journey out of this flat desert land, through the mountains, and over the hill to the land of promise that it takes a little extra to go beyond. It takes something a little more than desert walking. Anybody can handle it just walking around on flat ground. But when you get up into the mountainous country, it gets treacherous sometimes. The hills can be steep sometimes. The passes become narrow. And sometimes it looks like there's not a way up and you have to claw and fight your way over. So it's not going to be an easy trip, Israel. Not only will there be the climb, not only will there be the territory, but you will be passing through enemy country. You'll have to make extra provision. God told them you cannot uh, fight with these people as you go through. And you have to buy provision from them. So you're going to have to be prepared for this journey. It's going to take something extra even before you get started. It'll be tough and you'll have to go beyond. When you're living in the desert, it's so easy to coast along on the goodness of God. It's easy for us even. Oh, we're so thankful for the blessings of the Lord and I am thankful for His blessings. But it would be so easy for me just to compass the goodness of God. And to just wander around. Not really going anywhere in the Lord. Just wandering around in a big circle. And coming around and finding that I had been in the same place time and time again. And how often do we hear people say, I feel like I just keep going back to the same place in the Lord. I feel like I'm not really getting anywhere in the Lord. What's my problem? I don't understand it. The Lord's blessing me. The God, Lord seems to have His hand on my life. But I can't seem really to get anywhere in the Lord. What is it? I don't believe it's the will of God for us to stay in the desert. 2 Corinthians 8 tells me that there is a place where I can abound. I can abound in the things of God. For too long, we have wandered around in the desert of complacency, folks. Just content with a little manna and one suit of clothes. Just content with whatever comes my way. I don't know about you, but I wasn't meant to live on manna all my life. I said, I was not to meant to live on manna all my life. 
And after a while, wearing the same suit of clothes, you start to stink. And I believe that we were not intended to stay in this place. Jesus said, I have meat that you know not of. He said, I've got some things prepared for you. If you will somehow consecrate yourself to me, if you will give yourself over to me, and if you will go beyond this place where you are now, there is a place in me. There is a place if you are willing to go beyond. If you're willing to go beyond. But there is a catch. Between me and where God has planned for me to be, there lies a mountain range. And it's not as easy as the desert walking. It'll take some extra effort. Payne said it so well. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. And when things become dear to us and precious to us, we learn their real value. But when we're walking around in the desert and everything comes easy and there's no fight for anything, then we'd start to take it all for granted. Even the goodness of the Lord and the blessings of the Lord. Oh, well, it's just, it comes every day just like rain. It falls from heaven and we don't have to do anything for it. We don't have to put forth any effort for it. Just go out and pick it up. God is so good to us. But there's a place, I believe, in the mind of God for us to live and to dwell. There is a place beyond those mountains that God has intended for us to live in this life. And in order to get there, we must go beyond. We must go beyond. When we start out into this range of hills, the first place we're going to come to is Edom, the land of the children of Esau. Esau, the man who is supposed to be the brother of the people of God. But the Bible tells us that God hated Esau. What is it that could make God hate one man so much that it would be written in the word of God, Esau, have I hated? I can tell you why. Because Esau did not care for the things of God. Esau despised the things of God. Esau sought after the things of the earth. Esau only saw carnal things, only things that would bring him immediate pleasure and satisfaction. Here's Esau, supposed to be our brother, supposed to be one of us. But if we are to go beyond, we've got to get, travel through the country of Esau and not let him affect us. We've got to go beyond the land of Esau. We've got to go beyond the land of the carnal desire. We've got to go beyond that land of selfishness and want of things for ourselves. If we are to inherit the will and the plan of God for our lives, we've got to look forward and go beyond that. I've got to get beyond that. After we pass through Edom, we've got to travel through Moab. We know the history of the Moabites. Moab was born when Lot was seduced by his own daughter. The spirit of Moab is the spirit of seduction. The Bible tells us that before the last of the Israelites made it through Moab, they lingered just a little too long in the land of Moab. And they began to be seduced by the Moabite women. And along with that seduction came an introduction into the idolatry and the gods that they served. I want to tell you, if you linger in Moab, it won't be long before the spirit of Moab is trying to get a hold of you and trying to introduce you to some other gods and some other things other than the one true God. I want you to know that there is a spirit in this world that says you can do what you want. You can have what you want. Just come worship at our altar. Just hang around with us for a while. But I want you to know that that spirit is a spirit of seduction. And Paul said, if I or an angel from heaven come preaching any other gospel than that which we have preached to you before, let him be accursed. And there is another gospel. And it has a slimy spirit. And we've got to avoid that. And the only way to avoid it is to go beyond it. We've got to be willing to go beyond some things. 
if we are to realize our full potential in the kingdom of God. We've got to be willing to go beyond to find that place of abounding in God. And I don't know about you, but that's the place that I long for today. That's the place that I so want to be. Not a place where I'm just wandering around, not really getting anywhere, but the place where God can really use me, where I can let go of myself and leave behind the carnality of this world and leave behind the falseness of this world and go into a land where God has some things prepared for me. I've got to be willing, though, to travel and go beyond. But Brother Sibley, all I see now are the mountains. And they look so big. They look too hard to cross. From down here, the mountains look so high. And I just don't know if, if I have the, the ability or not. I don't know if I can get over those things by myself. But if we look again at 2 Corinthians, we see the secret of the Macedonians. He said they were in a great trial of affliction. But in that great trial, there was an abundance of joy. And in their deep poverty, they abounded unto the riches of their liberality. How in the world, in this time of great sorrow, great suffering, great trial and tribulation in their lives, they were joyful. Somehow they managed to overcome the circumstances that were around them and to abound in the things of God. Not only that, they gave uh, an offering. Is what he was talking about. They li gave liberally an offering to be sent to another church even though they were poor. How did they manage it? For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power. Beyond their power. They managed to get beyond themselves. Paul said, I die daily. I die to the flesh. I die to selfishness. I die to my own carnal desires. My biggest enemy in this world is not the devil. My biggest enemy is not the world. My biggest enemy is the flesh. If I submit myself to God, that takes care of the devil. If I flee from worldly things, that take care, takes care of the world. But what I've got to live with every day is my own stinking flesh. And we talk so much of living below our privileges as if, oh Lord, I deserve to be in the promised land right now. I deserve to have exactly what I want in the Lord. But I believe that a lot of times when we talk about living below our privileges, what we're actually doing is living below our responsibility. Because it's only when we pay the price and go beyond that we receive the privileges. That we receive the things that God had intended. Brother, would you read Romans 12, 1 and 2? I beseech you therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Listen to it. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service. And the word reasonable there simply means rational. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed Here by it the is. renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. But you got to pay the price. You got to undergo that daily transformation of your mind. And what will happen? That she may prove what that is that good. Can prove. Go ahead. What is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's when I'll find what I'm looking for in God. If I can learn to get beyond this world and to be transformed in my own inner man, I can find the perfect will of God and the place that God has for me. When I am able to let go of self and to just get beyond. Not everybody has the spirit of a mountain climber. Some people are content just to climb up on one little old mohill and set up camp. Not go any further. But there are not 
just one mountain. There are many mountains to be conquered. A little higher than it's another plateau. And I believe as we travel through these various stages of that we overcome individually on our own. Nobody else can do it for us. And we conquer each mountain. There's the mountain of doctrinal truth. And I'm so thankful for truth. I thank God for the truth. I believe in one God and in baptism in Jesus' name for the repentance of my sins. I believe that it takes the power of the Holy Ghost to be saved. I believe that I've got to live in accordance with the Word of God. But there's something that goes beyond that. John 8.32 said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But if you read Hebrews 6 and 1, brother... Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Leaving them behind? No. But once we've conquered that mountain, we've got a hold of that truth. We know the doctrine. The doctrine has set us free. The truth has made us free. But now it's time, Paul said, to go on and to leave that. Let us go on into perfection. Let us go on into perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. You ever know people that are in that cycle? They pray through about every six months. Over and over we see it. What's wrong with those kind of folks? You know what they're doing? They're just compassing the mountain. They never pay the price that it takes to get over that first hill of doctrinal truth. I don't want to leave truth behind. I love truth with all my heart. But the apostle said that I've got to go beyond that. And there are some other things that God has intended for me and planned for my life. There is the mountain of worship and spiritual response. We're dead to the world and alive to the spirit. But I want to ask you, how hard is it for God to get your attention? How hard is it in your everyday life, in the routine day-to-day of things, for God to tap you on the shoulder? How long does it take Him to get your attention when He wants to talk to your heart? What is your, res- your spiritual response? If somehow we could measure it today, I wonder what the calculation would be for each of our lives. How dead are we to the world? And how alive are we to the Spirit The Bible says now is the time for true worshipers to worship in spirit and in truth. We need to learn to live lives of worship. Not just to worship in a sanctuary. Not just to worship when we come together and the uh, music starts and it's exciting and, and it's powerful and we feel the Spirit of God. But if we can learn to live lives of worship and to practice His presence every day in my life and in your life. Because it's in His presence that I learn to hear His voice. And I learn to receive of Him. And I learn to grow in Him. And I start uh, receiving some of that abundance. And start abounding in some things. Not just going in circles anymore. But abounding. And growing up in Him. Sometimes we just need to grow up. The apostle writing to another church said, I wish you would grow up in all things in Him. And at the mountain of worship, we learn to listen to God. Of course, there are always folks who enjoy the mountain of worship and they want to stay there. Remember Peter, the Mount of Transfiguration. The glory of the Lord had come down. Here's Jesus talking with Moses and Elisha. I think it was. Two other folks. And Peter's all excited. The glory of the Lord has fallen. Oh, man, this is the place to be, the mountain of worship. Man, I like it here. Lord, let's just build three temples. And so many times in our lives, we get to that plateau and that place of the mountain of worship, and we say, oh, it feels good here. This is the place where I enjoy being in the presence of the Lord and where the glory of the Lord is falling. So I think I'll just set up camp right here and stay right here. But we've got to go beyond even worship. There are more mountains to be conquered. There are some places that are a little steeper. There are places where the incline is a little rougher. 
How about the mountain of personal holiness? 1 Peter 1.16 says, It is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I know that all of you know how to look holy. But I want to ask you today, how is your mind dressed? What is your spirit wearing today? You see, when we start climbing some of these mountains, it gets a little tougher. And sometimes there, there are things that are in us that we didn't really realize. And we've got to let go of some weight that was weighing us down. And, and things that would cause us to stumble on the trail because it's going to get steep, folks. But we're going after something. There's something that we're, we're going for. And we can see it in the distant horizon of God. And on the mountain of personal holiness, I've got to strip myself of some things that might hinder me. Laying aside every weight, not just sin, but things that could be weights and that would weigh me down and that would hinder me on my path to personal holiness. Jesus said, turned to his disciples one day and said, your righteousness has got to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees over there. And I imagine their hearts sank. These guys look holy. You remember the class? They can't carry more than a fig on the Sabbath day and can't carry more than 20 or 30 yards. Oh, man, they look holy. They pray on the corners. Oh, it just, oh, man, if, any, if we could just be holy like them. But what did Jesus call them? He said, you're whited sepulchers. On the outside, you look so clean, but inside there's nothing but dead men's bones. And our righteousness has got to start on the inside. Our holiness has got to begin down in here. Because if we have that external appearance and don't have it in here, it's no good. We're just the same as the Pharisees. We're just the same as the scribes. There's no difference between us. We're just as big a hypocrite as they are. A little girl went to Sunday school one day. She said, Mom, came home, said, Mom, is it true that God lives inside of us? And her mom said, well, yes, that's true. And she said, well, is it true that God is bigger than us? And her mom said, of course, that, that's true. And she says, well, shouldn't some of God show through? Real holiness is where God shows through. Where there's a purity of mind and purpose and heart where there's a quality of our conduct that goes beyond this outward appearance and looking holy to you and you looking holy to me. There has got to be something in us that's going to drive us and take us beyond that mountain and help us to overcome and to rise above just the external appearance and to put on the inward holiness. How? By putting on Him. By letting Him show through. By getting more of Him in me. We've got to go beyond. You know, we, we say, oh, well, I'm, I'm just following a trend. That's all. It's just a trend. But I have to tell you today that I really believe that if you follow the fads of the world, that that is a spiritual decision before it becomes a physical reality in your life. Amen. Amen. Finally, we come to the mountain of spiritual discipline. 2 Timothy 2 and 21, Paul said, Be prepared, Timothy, for every good work. And how can we be prepared unless we develop discipline in our lives? We are no good to God, to ourselves, or to anybody else until we develop some spiritual discipline in our lives. I believe John nailed it down pretty clear. He said in 1 John 2, 16 and 17, what did he talk about there? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. He said, these are the things of the world. This is the spirit of the world. But I believe that in our spiritual discipline that we have a way to go over that mountain. For the lust of the flesh, which is the sinful desires, there's a thing called fasting. And let me tell you, if you're bothered by the lust of the flesh, try fasting for three or four days. Do you a world of good. There is the lust of the eyes. Materialism and material desires. 
And how did the Macedonians overcome that? They gave abundantly. And if I'm busy giving away, I don't have any time to hoard. And I don't have any time to draw to myself. And then the pride of life is the desire to exalt my own self. And there's only one way that that thing can be broken, and that's through prayer. And it's really the mountain of spiritual discipline that can take us beyond and into the promised land. Only then can God get our attention. Only then can God use us in intercession. Only then can we develop the sensitivity to the mind of the Spirit. And only then can we live in the flow of the Spirit of God. Only then can we enter the promised land and the deep and hidden treasures that are found only in Christ Jesus. There's a battle to be fought. TBC, I believe that you are the cream of the crop. There are no others like you. I believe that God has brought you to this place and that he's going to lead you on from here. And I want to ask you today, if we don't lead the way for others, who else will go? Will the teenagers back in your home church go? No. Will the people that you're going out to minister to be able to make it on their own? No. Somebody's got to be the lead man over the mountains. And if I could be the Tom Paine of TBC, this is what I would tell you. These are truly the times that try men's souls. Part-time Pentecostals and self-centered saints will not stand in this hour of desperation. Hell's tyranny is not easily conquered, but we have the assurance that the freedom that we gain will be worth the fight. The present crisis demands more than mundane mediocrity. It demands solid soldiers of the cross. It demands soldiers set apart for service in God's army. An army that's not defined by age or by ability, but by determination and dedication to the cause of our supreme commander. Soldiers who are persistent under pressure, who will be faithful under fire, who are not afraid to die, to die to self and to sin, and who have the courage to cross every mountain in order to gain the victory. And if you stand in closing... I would like to read to you about an old man. In fact, he was about 80, 85 years old. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 7, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me up from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart to begin with. It was in his heart. And then in verse 11. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so my strength is now for war. Both to go out and to come back in. Now, therefore, give me this mount. Whereof the Lord spake. God has promised us some mountains, folks. And it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. The time to start is now. And the place is right here. I'm tired of compassing the mountain. I'm ready to put on my mountain boots. I'm ready to head north. I'm ready to go forward in God. I believe there are some things in God that I haven't experienced yet and that you haven't experienced yet. I believe there are some things that God has planned for us if we're willing to go beyond. God bless you.